relationship. One of the most difficult human experiences that we all, sooner or later, probably many of us already, experience is the loss of someone we really love, who, on whom we depended. Uh, it leaves us feeling orphaned, even if it's not our parents. It's, uh, the loss of a friend that you spent your whole life uh, in friendship with. And that's the kind of situation that Jesus is addressing right in this case. This, the context of this reading, uh, John 14, is uh, the Last Supper. And Jesus says he won't leave us orphans, but of course within less than a day, they would have seen this beloved friend destroyed, tortured, murdered, buried. And so uh, he understood, and he was warning them, but how do you deal with that? It's hard enough for us, isn't it, when, we're, when someone we love is slowly dying. You know, you say to yourself, uh, you know, how am I going to deal with this? And we know it's coming, but in this case, it was as sudden and as shocking and as vicious as it could be. So, but he says that he's going to send an advocate. Now, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The key to his indwelling spirit is if we live as he did. In other words, every intention of God is that we might have everything we need to, to deal with whatever comes uh, in this world and for eternity. You know, that's why he says, I'll remain in you if you're loved. If you obey my commandments, it opens the door for him to be his transforming power for us. And so, and what is the, what are these commands? Well, obviously in the Gospel of John, he repeats over and over again, that you shall love your God, your heart, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But commandments, I think it is the life and teaching of Christ. In other words, it's not simple. How do you do that? How do you love? How are you going to... You, know, you, you live like Jesus did. In other words, you forgive like He forgave. Uh, you cherish as He cherished. You generous as He's generous. You're a healing force as He was a healing force. And so on. In other words, it's you you take the example with the Holy the Advocate that he talks about that he's that, that we all have through our baptism and confirmation. And you allow that transforming power to to live and transform you. And so that's it. But it still is it is for us the assurance. Now the the first reading shows you that even catastrophe can yield surprising results in Jesus Christ, right? I told you that what's pro pro what provoked Philip leaving town was that he was running for his life. Um, they, they had a bloodlust after uh, the, the murder of uh, Stephen, and they were going after all the Christians at that point. So the apostles wisely said, it's time. Like refugees and immigrants, it's time to leave. But instead of being just a catastrophe, Philip goes down to Samaria, begins to pray, you heard, begins to proclaim the gospel, and the people are hungry to hear it, and all the signs that accompany it. And then, of course, uh, the Acts says that Peter and John, who are still in Jerusalem, hear, and they go down to confirm what, they, what they've heard, and to pray for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. In other words, even a catastrophe, can yield enormous results. A good friend of mine, many, many, many years ago, was uh, rejected uh, by a particular diocese. He wanted to join us in that, but he was And uh, it was, you can imagine, right? Like any of us who have suffered rejection, a uh, seeming disaster. Roll forward many years, he's so thankful for what happened. Because life bore such surprising fruit in Christ. In other words, there's not a scintilla of resentment left. Because God's grace working in him transformed. And that's the power, see? There's, that's why you cannot be crushed if you're working in Christ. Yes. Can you lose your job? Yes. Can your contract end? Yes. Uh, all of that can happen to you. Can your best friend die? You know, and so on. You know, all of that. But 
this is not, that's the, 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 really the message of Christ living in you, that this is, you are not, be, you will not be orphaned. Now, the beauty of that, of testimony, is the world is hungry for this kind of message. Not just people who come to church on, on the weekend, right? Uh, but you know human beings are hungry for a word of hope. And that's why that second reading says you should be ready to have a, a gentle and respectful response when they say, how is it you can live through this? You know, how, how do you, you say, you know what it is? It's not me. It's God's love for me. You know, it's not a, it's a gentle proclamation out of the witness of what God has done in your life that can, can bring others who need the same message that you and I need to a saving hope in God. And it's not, it's not brutal and rough. I remember uh, uh, many years ago, Washington Post Magazine had uh, an article on how to handle a bore at a cocktail party, right? The lines you could say. You know, and so. and uh, I remember that there were a lot of very funny lines, but one of them was, as they're talking to you, say, well, I can see that you haven't been washed in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> well, that is not what Peter is suggesting. <laughs> that is not an evangelical approach to, to sharing the hope with what you so so there is, yes, it's extreme extraordinary. Jesus was extraordinary. There was no false advertising, realistic about what life and persecution and anything else could throw at us. But that bothered him not at all because by obeying the commandments and by cooperating with the advocate, the Holy Spirit, uh, life will be simply flourish no matter what happens. Now, we have uh, seven or eight who are receiving first communion. Are you all still awake? <laughs> You've got a job that your parents can't do because they're not, they're, you're not going to school tomorrow, but on Tuesday you'll be back in school and they will not be with you nor will your grandparents or anyone else. Your job is to take the Eucharist, the love of God that you receive when you receive the body and blood of Christ and bring it to your classroom on Tuesday morning. You could start with your parents and relatives today, but your job is no one else can do it. You've got classmates who need your love, they need your respect, and if you give it, you will be awakening in them the same hope and joy that you have. So, um, and it's not on you, but since you're receiving your first communion today, the same goes for the parents, right? They're not going to work with you on Tuesday, so who is, who's going to make the difference? You are, or not. So we all have a challenge.